the smallest star. The picture illustrates the relative size compared to the Sun and Jupiter of a recently discovered star, the smallest ever detected. Called OGLE TR 122b, it has a ring to it. It is observed to cross in front of a sun like companion about once every seven days. The description of Ogle TR 122 b is enigmatic, though it is only 16% larger than the gas giant Jupiter. Astronomers say that it is 96 times as massive. Astronomers describe the smallest star as a core burning star, like our Sun. But prevailing theory never anticipated such a diminutive star. Since the standard fusion model of stars required a minimum gravitating mass considerably greater than that of Jupiter, to account for the highly anomalous object, and in particular the induced wobble in the motion of its larger companion, Astronomers simply accepted what their model implied. While Ogle TR-122b is only 16% larger than Jupiter, it must contain 96 times the mass of Jupiter and 50 times the density of the Sun. Investigative team member astronomer Claudio Mello of the European Southern Observatory in Santiago, Chile, summarizes the achievement of the small star this way. Imagine that you add 95 times its own mass to Jupiter, and nevertheless end up with a star that is only slightly larger. The object just shrinks to make room for the additional matter, becoming more and more dense. But this hypothesized feat of shrinking or supercondensing matter is merely hypothetical. Nothing of the sort has ever been achieved in laboratory experiments and no one has ever observed such a thing anywhere in the natural world. Were the feat not required to save a theory, astronomers would have surely called it a violation of the self-evident laws of physics. Another viewpoint is now well established. You know, they're like, ah, it's too hard to change the paradigm. Besides, the textbook lobby in Washington is one of the nation's most powerful. However, in this view, the calculations of the mass of this dwarf star are highly inflated. They do not take into account the strong electromagnetic forces between the small star and its larger parent star, nor does it factor in our profound ignorance of the nature of mass and gravity and its relationship to the electrical structure of matter. In the electric universe model, gravitational distortion of atoms within a star gives rise to atomic electric dipoles that align to form a radial internal electric field. The electric field produces charge separation within a star on a scale that not only prevents further compression but also causes splitting or perturbation, perturbation of a star in a nova outburst if it becomes electrically or gravitationally destabilized. The standard stellar model, however, re relies on the interior of stars obeying the perfect gas laws, which allows astrophysics to dismiss internal charge separation, as Eddington did in his seminal work, The Internal Constitution of the Stars. The result of electrical splitting is two energetic bodies of unequal size, a sun-like star and a smaller close-orbiting binary partner. As we see in this example, the electric birth of the companion star or gas giant will place it much closer to its parent than traditional gravity-based models had ever envisioned or even considered possible. OGLE TR-122b is not a super-dense companion but it is merely a subject to stronger electromagnetic interaction with its parent star. But it is merely subject to stronger electromagnetic interaction within its parent star, due to the nature of its birth. Where the electric force is active in this way, Newtonian calculations of mass and density will always produce bizarre results. 
Electrically, the standard threshold mass for a star in a meaningless concept. Electrically, the standard threshold mass for a star is a meaningless concept. Stars do not have to ignite a fusion reaction in their core to produce their energy. They receive electrical power directly from the cosmic Birkeland currents that thread the galaxy, and the nuclear reactions occur not in the core, but at the bright photosphere of a star. This is a testable claim, if astronomers will ask the question. Unfortunately, when orthodox theorists confront the failure of Newtonian concepts, they often turn first to panaceas, Part-erision. Panacea. proposing mere abstractions such as dark matter or super-condensed degenerate matter to save the theory. To the cosmic electricians, these computer games have no relationship to the verifiable dynamics of the natural world. It's dated March 8, 2005, from Thunderbolts. A mainstream scientist and author has come clean and admits Saturn was once a star. Is it though? Mundan. Gas giant vindication and why Dr. Eugene Lee killed. All known for gas giants in the solar system were once planet X stellar cores, SC. Earth, H, was a central SC of a planet, X SC system. The systems were comprised of the core system that was once inside a star or a planet and the debris pieces which had once constituted the body material of the object. When stars become energy depleted, the material that made up the body of the stars and that had been created by the cores broke into pieces and the cores were released from inside the body of the star. They became a jumbled mess of cores surrounded by debris field. Figure one here is a beautiful picture of Saturn. It's nine times larger than the Earth. And like Jupiter, it was a large central core of what was once a star. Planets will tend to be about the same size as the Earth and thus have a core system with a central core. Now, that would be smaller than the Earth. Now, that is something that really caught my attention because I have always thought that somehow all of the cores in the solar system of the, the sun's surface with the cores of all the planets, I mean, how else would they stay hot? They have to continuously be going through this effect where it would cool down. I'm sure the Earth's rotation probably helps too, but it has to be connected to something extraterrestrial, and when they're a safe distance away, it's not as very volatile. It doesn't take billions of years to cool down. The sun and the core of the earth are the same temperature, which is a big indicator that they're connected via Birkeland currents. In fact, this picture right here can be looked at by the sun's Birkeland current to earth. Is that what we're looking at here? Or is that just a, some kind of a mirage? Anyways, get back to it here. Figure 2, a star's core breaks into one larger core surrounded by satellite cores. Some of the satellite cores are ejected outside of the body of the star and turn into new planets. See Article 785, Planet X is here, but what is it exactly? Saturn was thus most likely one of the first planet X stars, which came into the solar system and must have therefore been relatively close to the sun. Since much larger cores have since come in, and since the central core must be smaller than the body of the star, Saturn must have been quite a small star, since the sun is over ten times larger than it. The central SC, I want to think that means surface charge, but it means something else to her, of the planet X SC system, shown in figure two, seemed to be larger than the sun, and some 
which seem to be much larger than the sun, have been observed, which suggests that the smaller stars came in first and the larger stars have come in more recent, come in to wear, which also explains why the cataclysmic effects caused by these systems on the Earth have been increasing at a fast rate. Larger systems can draw energy at a faster rate, which will increase the gravitational effects, which lead to gravitational anomalies. Cataclysmic weather, large waves at sea, as well as earthquakes and volcanic eruptions, in addition to sinkholes and fissures. Other Planet X effects on Earth, volcanic eruptions, tornadoes, tidal surges, and gigantic rogue waves. Since Saturn was once a star, it would have had planets, which most likely came in with it, or right after it did. Of course it did, and Earth was one of them. You know, they're catching on, slowly but surely, they're catching on. Saturn's rings are what is left of its debris field. Yes, that's true. It is made up of matter which was part of the body, water mostly, of the star that Saturn once was. Brown dwarfs have copious amounts of water. The central cores induce plasma eruptions from the sun until the sun envelops them in a permanent plasma connection, which sustains them with energy as if they were one of the sun's created planets, after which time they go into orbit around the sun. They never manage to get enough gravitational energy, which we would associate with a solid object of their size, which is why they end up orbiting inside the solar system much further out than would be expected for huge solid objects. Well, the bigger they are, the more surface charge they have, which means they have to be further away to be able to repel. That's, just, that's how I take that. Solid objects with only a thin layer of gaseous atmosphere. In conclusion, Saturn was once a small star and thus most likely had planets. It came into the solar system as a planet X central core and was adopted by the Sun as one of its planets. How about that? A mainstream scientist is on the Saturn theory bandwagon. I, I believe, like Ted said, in 30 years, I think some, some sort of Saturn theory will replace the Big Bang eventually. Ah, uh, yes, the fusion assumption has never been authenticated. And one other thing that I would say is, what does she think the energy is when she says the energy? It's electricity. It's the only thing it can be. The only force in the universe. That's what they suppress. She's on the right track, but she's using the wrong model. Cores of stars are cool. That's why they're black. Unless they have some new epicycle to injure, when something is hotter, it's brighter, and the core would be brighter in, su in sunspots, not uh, well, a black hole, basically. This is the only real black hole that exists in the universe, a sunspot, the umbra. How can nuclear fusion be black? It can't. It's just commonsensical that if nuclear fusion was going on in the core, that it wouldn't be black. Her theory sounds an awful lot like uh, like De Grazia and Milton's Solaria Benaria. I'll link that to this for you. It was Velikovsky's claim that only a few thousand years ago, a period of chaos reigned in the solar system. One of the planets closely associated with Earth was Saturn, and watery filaments rained on our planet following Saturn's violent flare-up. Decades later, based on the respective research of Dave Talbot and Eduardo Cardona, Thornhill developed his own model of a primordially close relationship between Earth and Saturn, which was the source of all the water in our oceans, while leaving remnants in its rings. Today, Thornhill continues his presentation, shifting his focus to his own successful predictions for the Saturnian system, including the mysterious moon Titan. Before I tell the epic story, a warning. 
Our education systems train students to memorize a litany of facts, which produces global groupthink. Students are not given the time or encouragement to critically examine the history of ideas. A leading researcher into the learning functions of the divided brain, Dr. Ian McGilchrist, has shown such blinkered left hemisphere training renders students functionally blind to alternative ways of looking at a problem. The left hemisphere simply blocks out everything that doesn't fit with its take. It doesn't see it, actually, at all. So scientists with their narrow specialised training may look at but cannot see what to a non-expert may seem obvious. They will be the last to see a paradigm shift in the making. This is particularly evident for electrical phenomena in space. Even the Nobel Prize winning founder of the idea of an electric universe, Hans Ophain, was ignored when he warned in his 1970 acceptance speech of an inevitable crisis in astrophysics if electric circuits in space are not recognised. Houston, we still have that problem after almost 50 years. I have lived since a teenager with uncertainty about accepted truths and learned to have the courage to challenge them. The result is not chaos, but a synthesis of ideas that explains the old ideas better and finds new ways of incorporating what seems a chaos of anomalies. And the best test is that of classical physics – simplification. The resulting paradigm shift is not a threat, but an invitation to the greatest adventure we may ever know – to begin to understand our real place in the universe for the first time. In our electric universe, stars and planets are formed at the same time inside molecular clouds, along a snaking cosmic lightning bolt. Gravity plays no role in the process. Since cosmic lightning takes the form of a twisted pair of current filaments, it is found that most stars are in pairs, or multiples. Planets will tend to do the same. Like the snaking filaments in a novelty plasma ball, the star-forming filament moves on, leaving a string of massive objects behind to gravitationally form the weird and theoretically challenging zoo of exoplanetary systems recently discovered. Some gas giant planets are subsequently formed in close orbits about a star that has ejected charged matter to achieve stability with a changed electrical environment. The ejection flares may account for the flickering of newborn stars, which can't be explained by gravitational accretion. This explains the unexpected hot Jupiter seen in large numbers closely orbiting other stars. The most numerous stars in the galaxy, brown dwarfs, which would appear reddish if they could be seen with the naked eye, are generally classed as failed stars, yet they have the baffling ability to produce massive stellar flares. This is simply explained because red stars don't have the ability of main sequence bright stars to control their current by a transistor-like action in their photospheric plasma. A brown dwarf can only respond by discharging matter electrically. The capture process of a brown dwarf star involves flaring and ejection of charged matter by that body in order to achieve a new electrical equilibrium in its adopted family. That accounts for the large number of close-orbiting moons of our captured gas giants in remote orbits. With this in mind, I want to take you back to just before the famous Cassini-Huygens space probe was to arrive at Saturn on July 1, 2004. In news reports, Saturn was dubbed the original Lord of the Rings. There is a profound truth behind such a glib turn of phrase. But it wasn't until the advent of the telescope that Christian Huygens, in 1656, was able to suggest that Saturn had a ring. So how do we explain the Saturnian ring symbolism that pervades our cultures? The halo of the saints, the royal crown, and the ring given in marriage are Saturnian symbols, as are the circled or Celtic cross, the Egyptian ansate cross or ankh, the Eye of Ra and the astronomically baffling star inside the crescent. The star at the top of the lighted Christmas tree is pure Saturnian imagery. It is truly amazing that we are still haunted by prehistoric archetypes. It helps us to understand the extraordinary archetypal attraction of Tolkien's fantasy of Lord of the Rings. He was well versed in mythology. 
The following description of events is based on the surprisingly detailed and truly remarkable scholarship of Talbot and Cardona, which required explanations with the physics of an electric universe. Let's call our primordial star Proto-Saturn. It was an independent brown dwarf with its own entourage of satellites, including the Earth, Mars and Titan. Proto-Saturn's dim reddish light was due to a glowing red anode plasma sheath, much larger than the Sun, enclosing Proto-Saturn and its inner satellites in a radiant cell. The term dwarf star is purely theoretical, since they are difficult to see and measure. In fact, NASA reported a brown dwarf which was radiating as if it had twice the expected surface area. The environment inside the radiant red shell is most hospitable for life on any enclosed satellites because there are no seasons and water is conspicuous in the spectra of such stars. Water misted down on this planet continually and red light is ideal for photosynthesis, which explains the abundance of ferns and other vegetation globally in the Carboniferous era. But there is a catch. Brown dwarf stars are known to flare, sometimes to the extent, as one astronomer commented, that any satellites would suffer a very bad day. Such flaring by Proto-Saturn accounts for the geological strata and the fossil record of a number of global mass extinctions and instant burial of dismembered plant and animal remains. As we approached the Sun from deep space, our plasma sheath flickered like a faulty electric light when the two stellar plasma sheaths, or magnetospheres, began to clash. Proto-Saturn's galactic electrical power was usurped by the Sun and its appearance changed dramatically. Before dimming forever, the dwarf star Proto-Saturn would have flared brilliantly like a comet, ejecting charged matter to relieve the electrical stresses caused by the sudden change in environment. Even now the former star has not completely cooled. Saturn still radiates more than twice the heat it receives from the Sun. And we have a simple explanation for the origin of Saturn's mysteriously short-lived water-ice rings. As the proto-Saturnian system approached the Sun in the outer solar system, our minor star's gravitational sphere of influence steadily shrank and its outer satellites were progressively stripped away. This and the earlier capture of the other gas giants provides the source of trans-Neptunian objects as they're known, including Pluto with its unexpected geology and atmosphere, and its peculiar moons. There is a simple physical characteristic that links a captured star with its offspring. It is the axial tilts. Like our close orbiting moon, satellites tend to orbit their primary with the same face always turned toward it. If they orbit in the equatorial plane, their spin axis will be aligned with that of the primary. As gyroscopes, the satellites will retain the same tilt even if jolted from their orbit, although the process may induce a wobble of the spin axis. It is therefore highly significant that the two key planets identified in the ancient pantheons, Saturn and Mars, have axial tilts closely similar to that of the Earth. The tilt of Saturn at 27 degrees to the ecliptic plane is itself an enigma, unless it formed independently from the Sun. Venus was described as a spectacular discharging body in the ancient congregation of planets, it can be explained if Venus was ejected in the flare-up of Proto-Saturn and the infall of the stream of ejected matter from swiftly rotating Proto-Saturn gave Venus a slow retrograde spin. The magnitude of the axial tilt of Venus to the ecliptic is much less than Saturn's, which suggests that Venus was ejected from a low latitude. This accounts for the hellish temperature and new surface of Venus having been recently spat from the mantle of a brown dwarf star. Its filamentary equatorial scars caused by spectacular radial discharging and its thick atmosphere inherited from the brown dwarf and subsequently modified by interplanetary and cometary discharges. Venus still has a cometary magnetotail stretching to the Earth's orbit and its mountain tops glow with plasma discharges which return Magellan's radar signals as unexplained shininess past history. The solar nebula model has no successful predictions to its name. That's a bit of a sobering thought. 
My meeting uh, with Dr. Velikovsky, I visited him in 1979 at his home in Princeton, New Jersey. He very gracefully uh, uh, accepted it, uh, my family as well. I've got photos of my daughters with him, but none with me. I was rather shy of <laughs> asking him for a photo. But the main question then was this uh, problem that he faced with astronomers. What don't we know about gravity? There's something really missing in our physics. Velikovsky argued that planets change orbits, exchange thunderbolts, and quickly settle into peaceful orbits. Rapid settling following chaos defies our understanding of gravitational systems, which for more than a two-body system are chaotic. As I said, if one planet departs from its normal orbit by a small amount, it will affect the others and there's no way of restoring the original situation. The system flies apart. Our understanding of gravity and solar system mechanics is inadequate. So, we have a new cosmology. A new forensic approach to old evidence produced a recent history of the solar system that requires a critical examination of modern science instead of dogmatic rejection of evidence. The result is an entirely new cosmology, the electric universe. The history of this new cosmological paradigm goes back to worlds in collision in 1950. In the last chapter, Velikovsky referred to Jupiter and Saturn as stars. And I quote, There I wrote with respect to the future that some dark star like Jupiter or Saturn may be in the path of the sun and may be attracted to the system and cause havoc in it. That was in chapter 9, the end. Worlds in Collision comprises only the last two acts of a cosmic drama, wrote Velikovsky in Kronos, volume 5, number 1, in 1979. That's the Kronos issue there. And then we have Dave Talbot's remarkable reconstruction of the earlier acts in our prehistoric skies, and that was published in 1980. Then in Eon, Volume 5, Number 5, in January 2000, I first published my physical model of Earth's relationship to the dark star dubbed Proto-Saturn in Stars in an Electric Universe. It had appeared earlier on my website as Other Stars, Other Worlds, Other Life in December 1999. And then we have all the books uh, by Eduardo Cardona, and they're all there. God Star, published 2006, Metamorphic Star, 2008, Primordial Star, 2009, Flare Star, 2011. So the evidential history is Earth and Mars were satellites orbiting a brown dwarf star. It was a very hospitable environment for life. Atmosphere, water and minerals were deposited on the satellites. The system changed spectacularly on encountering the sun. The brown dwarf flared and ejected a new satellite. An axial column of satellites was formed and intense plasma discharge phenomena were observed. The terms giant and dwarf applied to stars are misleading. They're just calculated on the standard model of the sun. And the notion of a star's age based on its appearance or spectrum has no validity for the same reason. Stars on the main sequence may be characterised as self-regulating cosmic power transformers, as I spoke about this morning, that focus diffuse galactic electrical energy to catalyse fusion in their photospheres to provide radiant energy. Like the Sun, such stars derive their luminosity from very bright anode tufts in their plasma sheaths. Moving diagonally upward to the right, the current density increases. Anode tufting becomes more crowded and their mutual repulsion forces the photosphere to grow to accommodate them. At the top right of the main sequence, the light from those tufts is electric blue of a true arc and the stars appear as blue giants, intensely hot objects appearing considerably larger than our sun. As you might expect, blue giants tend to be concentrated on the central axes of our galaxy's spiral arm discharges. Red stars must collect more electrons than the plasma can deliver continuously to its surface. So bright anode tufts are unnecessary. The anode expands instead by forming a negative space charge sheath. And as that sheath expands, its electric field grows stronger. Electrons caught up in the field are accelerated to ever greater energies. And before long, they become energetic enough to excite neutral particles they collide with in the outer sheath to take on a uniform red glow. 
A white dwarf is a star whose discharge current is satisfied by all the approaching electrons. Drift electrons plus those that randomly move towards the anode. It has no anode tufting. It is rather like moving a low energy corona of a main sequence star down into the atmosphere of the white dwarf star. That's why the star, <coughs> the, the dim star, Sirius B, is brighter in X rays than Sirius A because the corona emits X rays. So, what is a brown dwarf? To summarise, a red or brown dwarf can be characterised as an independent gas giant type object under low electrical stress from its galactic environment. A main sequence star is electrically stressed, so it resorts to becoming a tufted anode, which, as I said, regulates the output of the star. This is why most all bright stars appear to uh, twinkle. Um, at they don't change uh, from day to day. Red giants are normal stars under low electrical stress. White dwarfs are stars with a low luminosity coronal discharge only. Uh, is that at the same point? Red giant, giants are normal stars under low electrical stress. And white dwarfs. So, size matters. Brown dwarfs come with a major drawback for astronomers. Their stellar radii are hard to determine accurately. In the electric universe, brown dwarfs are not dwarf stars. Instead, all red stars have a bloated glowing anode sheath which expands and contracts in order to collect the amount of electrons required for that discharge. As the anode sheath grows, its electric field grows, which results in the prodigious and unexplained stellar winds from cool red giants. If the, if the winds were due to the heat of the corona, then uh, this, this puts paid to that idea. In a December 2008 NASA report, the brightness of a brown dwarf at 17 light years distance was twice that expected for a brown dwarf with its particular temperature. The solution? The object must have twice the surface area, they said. It must be twins. Such ad hocery is unnecessary in the electric universe model. A brown dwarf's photosphere is much larger than the standard model of such stars predicts. The cradle of life. <clears throat> and this gets back to the idea of uh, the Garden of Eden period in, um, in man's memory. If you are a satellite orbiting within that anode glow, and this is not an outrageous idea because astronomers have suggested the same thing for red giants, that planets could actually orbit within that... Uh, star because the atmosphere is such low density. In fact, we orbit in the sun's atmosphere, if you like, and it doesn't uh, cause us any trouble. But within that glowing shell, uh, the radiant energy received from that envelope is constant over the entire globe. The light from the plasma sphere is not reflected light, it's a radiant energy. Brown dwarfs radiate blue and ultraviolet light even though they are cool at a temperature around 950K. This is further evidence that we are looking at a mix of an electrical red anode glow and coronal ultraviolet blue end of the spectrum. There are no seasons, no tropics and no ice caps. A planet does not have to rotate, its axis can point in any direction and its orbit can be eccentric and you'll still get this beautiful even temperature over the whole body. The radiant energy received by the planet will be strongest at the blue and red ends of the spectrum, so photosynthesis, which relies on red light, would uh, be very active. The skylight would be a pale purple, which maybe is referred to by the classical purple dawn of creation. And I know that in Canberra we have this new arboretum, which is fantastic, and all of the new trees that are being planted are put in red plastic to start with and I asked the, uh, the head of the arboretum why they did that and he said the plants grow much better in red light. Water molecules dominate the spectra of brown dwarfs so you want to know where the Earth's water came from. The light on Earth was dim and purplish amid a continuous mist of water. No other bodies in the system were visible. And this is what uh, Dave mentioned uh, yesterday. This explains the abundant water on Earth and many satellites of the gas giant planets and the rings of Saturn. 
and the red light, warmth and water was ideally suited for giant ferns. It explains the gigantic lush vegetation found at the poles, fossilised as coal. Now the problem faced by life on planets orbiting a red star, I think you saw last thing last night, which was this flaring red dwarf. So this tendency to flare up is a problem. The reason for this is, that, as I said, the red stars don't have the current regulation afforded by uh, the bright photosphere. So the response of a red star to a sudden electrical disturbance in their environment is to shed charged matter in a flare-up. They may also change in apparent size as the anode glow accommodates to the electrical environment. I think this would account for the great dyings in the geological record and the episodic deposit of vast sediment and mineral layers on the Earth and on other bodies too. Every body that's been looked at is layered. What's more, it explains for the first time the oceans of salty water on Earth. Comets cannot be responsible because they have little or no water and little or no sodium chloride. The mass extinctions. As I said, those flare-ups can be so drastic that it would practically wipe out the life on any existing life on um, those uh, satellites of that uh, dwarf star. This raises an interesting <coughs> uh, side issue, and that is, ironically, intelligent life can't communicate through a, such a plasma shell using radio waves. So the lack of intelligible radio signals in the SETI project is understandable. In fact, denizens of such worlds would most likely be unaware of the universe at large. Now, astronomers also submit that orbiting a red dwarf is possibly one of the best places to look for life. What they've never considered is orbiting inside a red dwarf. So this is a picture of the brown dwarf proto-Saturn as I see it. Now, there would have been many more bodies than you see there, but I've included Mars and Earth and Proto-Saturn because they're the main players at this stage. 50% of red dwarfs have Earth-sized planets in their conventional habitable zone. This suggests there are a large number hidden inside the red star's glow. And you can say that too because our gas giants all have large numbers of satellites orbiting quite closely. But you'll note there is no Venus at this stage. <coughs> Gigantism. It wasn't just pterodactyls that struggled to get up off the ground. The scaling of muscle and bone strength shows that dinosaurs could not have raised their bodies off the ground in today's gravity. For them to move about, Earth's gravity needed to be about one third of today's. Global extinction and fossilization requires far more than a simple impact. Clearly, we have no understanding of the cause of gravity. Is gravity electrical? The question is of fundamental importance for cosmology and our understanding of the solar system. And the answer should provide insights into the demise of the dinosaurs, the sky our ancestors saw, and why they feared doomsday. This is the crucial thing. This is the thing I asked Velikovsky. What don't we understand about gravity? <clears throat> and of course we're getting confirmation of a sort from this uh, comet visit. The gas giant Saturn. It's the outermost planet visible to the naked eye, moving on an orbit almost 900 million miles from the Sun. For those untrained in finding planets in the night sky, it could hardly be said that Saturn stands out amongst its starry companions. This lack of distinction underscores an unsolved mystery. Where did all of the extravagant images attached to this distant speck in the sky come from? The story of Saturn as creator. Saturn presiding over a lost golden age. Saturn as a primeval sun. Saturn's preposterous location at the celestial pole around which the heavens visually turn. Saturn is the founding father of kings. And Saturn is dying or displaced God. 
In due course, we'll take up the god's connection to an immense crescent, seen as a scythe or sickle turning in the sky. So too, the cosmic mountain, from which Saturn was said to have once ruled the world. And the planet god's role as divine ancestor of different nations, all recounting the same core idea. The mysteries will quickly overwhelm a researcher the moment he asks the present sky to explain the ancient themes. In fact, many scholars simply walked away from the dilemma. Here's the dilemma in a nutshell. The myths appear to be much older than any recorded observations of planets. The first flowering of the monumental civilizations occurred in an environment of myth and magic, there are no lists of planets, no diaries of planetary motions. The celebrated gods do not look at all like the planets we know so well today. So most scholars simply state that planetary behavior could not have provoked any of the great myths. The attachment of myths to planets must have come much later, perhaps in the first millennium BC. Our message, however, is that a radically different planetary arrangement prevailed in an earlier time. Planets, not in their present orbits, but planets, provoked all of the mythic archetypes. What we're offering in this series are reasons for known facts, things not disputed. This includes the fact that the astronomer priests themselves in recording the tranquil and predictable motions of planets in later times named these bodies explicitly as the great gods of the primeval epoch. And that's the heart of the dilemma. Why does the behavior of these most venerated gods so boldly contradict all observations of the named planets today? By working with the points of cross-cultural agreement, we'll see that the astronomical images of Saturn connect theme by theme with an archaic story told around the world, told long after most cultures had lost track of any planetary connections. The story says that in a former time, a central luminary, a motionless sun turned as a great wheel in the sky. But why an identification with the planet Saturn? It's said that this ancient power, the father of kings, presided over an age of natural abundance and cosmic harmony. But this story in its countless variations does not end well. It states that the world fell into confusion when the ruling god fled the theater or tumbled from his appointed station. Then the hordes of chaos were set loose and all of creation slipped into a cosmic night, the gods themselves battling furiously in the heavens, the clash of the titans. In the well-known Greek tradition, this was the story of the displaced god Kronos, the father of kings. Kronos was the Greek name for the planet Saturn. And yet, enigmatically, the same planet was also named Helios, the sun, a fact that has perplexed classical scholars for a century and a half. The shadow cast by Saturn reached across the millennia, even today, our language retains the age-old cultural ambivalence toward this most ancient god. The word Saturnian expresses the splendor of the Golden Age, while the word Saturnine reflects the melancholy of paradise lost. Guesses as to explanations will never work but an explanation based on systematic cross-cultural investigation will work, allowing a global story to mean what it says, even if that requires a measure of patience as verifiable pieces come one by one into a coherent picture of the ancient sky.